of the things we think, right. say, or do. Of the is things. It truth? Okay, or do. Is it truth? Is it truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Is, is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. Thank you, Rotary. Thank you. I would like to start off by welcoming the guest speaker of the evening, Dr. Dinesh Nayak, MD Director, Department of Neuroscience, Canadians of Global Health City, Chennai. I welcome you, sir. It's a privilege to have you here. Next, I would like to welcome you to Thank you for this meeting. Last week, is a busy one for us. We have done some projects about which Ashish, are can you ask uh, everybody to mute? Talking in a short while. I think somebody is. Yeah, everybody to mute. Yeah, please. Okay. Last week was a busy one for us. We we have done some projects about which our secretary Jagan Mohan will be talking in a short while. We organized a gift design workshop for ants and other ladies, I hope you have all heard about good things about it. Looking at the future, as some of you know that we have been able, we have been disc discussion with the collector and the G39 clubs of Rotary District 3201 to create infrastructure and beds for COVID patient at Kodesia. The, the costing of the project has been worked out at 13,500 per bed along with a welcome kit for 30 days. <coughs> a detailed breakup of this amount will be sent to you all later today. Uh, I am happy to inform you that Rotary Central has committed full support towards this endeavor. We are also planning to have a hosting ceremony at the Anakati School on the 15th of August. Shortly after the ceremony, we, we will be inaugurating 20 toilet blocks at Kutupuli Card Village. A special treat has been arranged for our members on Independence Day. Mr. Mohan Sundram, who is a renowned for his humorous speeches, will be speaking to all of us on this very platform on 15th of August. I'm looking forward to your active participant in these programs. Finally, I would like to clarify on a project that we had this week. Yes. This involved a gift of vision to a girl child named Hasni. Hmm. I have received a few queries on why the surgery did not take place at Shankara Hospital. I would like to throw some light on this. When we received the request from Dr. Rohini of Smart City, we had planned to organize the surgery at Shankara after meeting with Dr. Arya. However, since the girl was already admitted, at another hospital and also because the girl's guardians did not want to switch the hospital when the girl was going through a rough phase, we decided to support their decision of the, uh, their guardian. I hope all of you understand this and please let me know if any further clarity is needed on this. I now request Rotirin Jagan Mohan to deliver his secretary report. Yeah, thank you. Good evening Rotarian and Sanax. It's my pleasure inviting you all for the regular speaker meeting for this current Rotary year. Under the project Health and Hygiene, on 29th July, we have donated two numbers of water dispensers for COVID-19 patients in Kodisa Center for their clean drinking water requirement. The outlay of the funds for this program is approximately 36,000 rupees. Our club's first bulletin for the Rotary year was released on time at 12 past midnight on 1st of August all the accolades goes to our senior Rotarian Rajaram and Usha Rajaram and Annette Ashkenta. As a mark of respect for the recipient of Vocational Excellence Award earlier year of our club, Dr. Pranesh, leading neurologist at Koyamitu, we have cancelled our last week speaker meeting. We have arranged for a talk title, a tribute to our Dr. Pranesh, who passed away on 1st of August. Under the Global Grant Avenues, all the equipments given to Shankara Eye Hospital under Global Grant Projects, which was done last year, 
was installed and put to use. Regular usage report in the respect of the same will be received and submitted to the members. Under the Global Grant Project for the year 2020, we have donated life-saving equipment to Neo National Corps CMCH on 6th of August, partnering with Rotary Club of Gelsberg and Rotary Foundation. The total outlay of funds is, of this project is 45,000 USD. We have conducted a first workshop for this Rotary by your hands club. Eye care surgery for eight year old girl child, Asini, at Dr. Agarwal's Eye Center. The outlay of the funds for this program is of approximately 33,000 30, rupees. Wishes for this week. Rotary in Ravi Kaurder to celebrate his 60th birthday on 29th July. We wish him many, many happy times of the day. Our past president, Rotary in Arunachalam, was blessed with grandson on the 2nd of August. Best wishes to the family. Uh, now I request Rotary in Murli to introduce our speaker of the day, Dr. S. Dinesh Nayak, and say a few, about, few words about our chief guest. Thank you. Thank you. Jagan Mogan, thank you very much. I hope I'm audible to everybody. Yeah. Uh, the first and foremost thing is, um, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce a classmate of mine um, who is so accomplished today. So uh, welcome to this, uh, Dinesh. So uh, I have thoroughly misused the privilege of uh, being a friend to invoke his uh, presence here. And I know how difficult it is sometimes to uh, get appointments with Dinesh. So. Uh, I'm really thankful to him. So our journey begins uh, long, long back. Um, I think we have completed about 50 years of uh, association because we have been childhood friends. Uh, some of you may not be aware, uh, may not even know. So um, his family has the martyr in the form of his own brother, who was the role model to every one of us in school. So uh, his name is uh, Ramesh Naik. If he had retired uh, today from the Indian Army, he would have been holding the highest rank uh, in the Indian Army. Um, he uh, fell to the bullets of uh, the IPKF operation. Um, and uh, he was... Uh, that's the illustrious uh, nature of the family and the pedigree of leadership that comes uh, from his family. So all of us, whenever we recall uh, Ramesh Naik, uh, when we speak with Dinesh, uh, we are all, you know, touched. <coughs> Dinesh, so Dinesh did his, uh, both his um, undergraduate and postgraduate um, uh, training in medicine at our own CMC. Um, in Coimbatore, but unlike a few others, he went on to win uh, the uh, Muniratnam Chetty gold medal. So in case anybody tries in today's Google world to Google Muniratnam Chetty and gold medal, I can tell you 100% you will not get anything about the doctor. You will only get about gold, the Chetties, the gold of the Chetties and so on and so forth. So that is a very fun. I could not get the uh, illustrious nature, of course, even though I knew it. But otherwise, if you Google, you will not get it. Uh, he then went on to uh, do his uh, specialization in neurology. Uh, Institute. And I think all of you must be reading today uh, about Chitra Tirnal and the director and the, um, and the politics that is going on between the central government and uh, the Chitra Tirnal in terms of what they are doing. But I think... Uh, uh, it is still one of the most prestigious institutes of medical sciences and technology. And there also he um, uh, completed and was able to get a P. N. Berry scholarship that took him um, uh, to the King's um, College Hospital in London. So I've been there. It's a beautiful place. And um, epilepsy has been his... Uh, uh, no, doctor is a neurosurgeon. He's an area. Um, one thing about... Um, uh, I also was trying to understand because I have a lot of friends <laughs> out of GE and, uh, and uh, also about, uh, with Philips and other places. I wanted to 
needs absolute teamwork. Uh, one of the areas which I definitely know needs but before a patient is going to undergo, undergo a surgery, there is almost everybody who knows what is going to happen, what are these little probes going to sit, where are they going to sit, what are the areas it's going to sit, where are we making those uh, tiny little holes, how are we going to operate, what is the minimum damage that we do. So it is such a fantastic area, it's a specialized area. So uh, Dinesh has been um, guiding over 5,000 patients with those drug-resistant uh, epilepsy there. And he has also done, uh, been part of the epilepsy surgeries team for the last 25 years. A very accomplished person there. A lot of the um, uh, VIPs, whom some of them whom I know are his patients. So um, he's been there um, for a, a very long time doing this work. Like all uh, senior people, he also has trained over 50 uh, medical professionals in his area, uh, both nationally and internationally, and uh, has served in several of these uh, committees uh, and review review of uh, international journals like a lot of us do. And he has published also quite a lot, about 50 uh, articles in the area. Um, and I um, personally know Dinesh in almost a lot of capacities because we keep in touch on a, on a very day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So his family is um, a very sweet family. Uh, Dinesh is um, also um, an avid trekker. Um, like a lot of people, he has an interest in wildlife and um, he has done both Tower Hills uh, in the Himalayas to Scottish uh, Highlands, the Alps and so many other uh, uh, mountains that are part of uh, his trekking work. So, um, without going too much into his uh, CV, which I can read the whole evening, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Dinesh to this prestigious uh, club in Coimbatore, which has got doctors uh, here. As the secretary was mentioning, it was a privilege to uh, uh, all, uh, uh, you know, send a tribute to the board mentor and to, um, uh, Dr. Pranesh. So uh, we did that in the absence of you being not able to come on the meeting. Uh, and also uh, the president was kind enough to sort of get you back here because I was worried if you lose a slot, then we, you go 30 steps behind. So it's almost like a railway booking. So I was worried about that. Luckily, those things didn't happen. So welcome, uh, Dinesh. The floor is yours. Um, and thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, PM, uh, for that very, very kind and very uh, very lucid and, and very intensive. Uh, I don't know whether I deserve that kind of uh, an accolade, but an introduction. But I think uh, it, it just uh, shows the kind of love and affection that we've been having for the last uh, you know 50 years. We started off in 2007 and it's now 53 years of our partnership. It's wonderful. <laughs> And uh, it's a great uh, pleasure and a privilege uh, for me to be here. I mean, interacting with some of the the creme de la of uh, of 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 Coimbatore, uh, Rotary Club Central. I think it's it's a dream come true for me. <laughs> I always felt that you know, I mean, that's a very elite club, uh, which is uh, you know, it comprises it has has a very Hori uh, past and it's got a very vibrant uh, present and I'm sure it's going to have a very bright future ahead. It's, uh, you know, all these, uh, the, the members of uh, Rotary Club Central are pioneers in the fields of, you know, you take any field, you know, industry, uh, education, medis medicine, um, uh, business, uh, finance, you, sport, entrepreneurship, anything you take, Rotary Club is there, Central. And when PM uh, actually told me, I thought he was just joking because I had literally asked him, you know, I mean, are you kidding? I mean, that, you, you know, you're asking me to come and address this very uh, uh, distinguished uh, audience. And then he said, yeah, I mean, and then I was a bit nervous and I didn't know what, what subject I should be talking. And then as his uh, usual brilliant self, I mean, he just said, you know, you know <laughs> we'll have a kind of a provocative title. And he said, do we have brains? And that set me thinking, actually. And that's a very interesting uh, spin to the whole thing. Uh, you know, having been trained in neurology for more than 33 years, 
And then I suddenly said, yeah, yeah, that's a very, very provocative title. And how do we move forward with this? And then I had to, you know, uh, start thinking, imagining. And then there's a lot of material as to, you know, what's the journey of the brain and how we actually discovered, you know, the various aspects of the brain. And uh, my talk is going to be on that in the sense that, uh, you know, the journey of uh, how we understood the brain or and now we are understanding the brain in the 21st century, which I think is going to be the, uh, the century of the, of, of the brain. There's no doubt about it because there's a lot of exciting things that are happening. And uh, I would uh, like to take you through this journey uh, how the uh, kind of shift has happened from, you know, the heart to the brain uh, over the time, over the last uh, 20, 30 years. And uh, I would uh, do it with the presentation. So I would like to do the screen share and hope that it works. It works, uh, uh, Dinesh. I have enabled it for you. Oh, yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. So I'm sharing. Is that, uh, is it yeah. there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's the, uh, you know, it's a very provocative title. Do I have a brain? And uh, before I start that, uh, I must, uh, just a minute. Yeah, I, I must pay my, my tribute to my, my teacher, my every, he's, he's, he's just an embodiment of everything that uh, we stand for today. My teacher, my mentor, he considered me as his son. So I would say that I have not just lost a father figure, but I've lost uh, my father, Professor Pranesh. And uh, I think he has taught me almost everything apart from neurology and the brain function. I joined him in 1987 as a rookie, you know, just after my MBBS. And I had not got my uh, PG seat, I, I, I didn't get it that year, so I joined his clinic in 1987. And ever since, he's been the, the guiding force and the guiding spirit. I mean, he has been involved in every aspect of my journey. And uh, that is his, uh, his wonderful family. And we were part of his family. I mean, that's, that's as simple as that, you know, that, that very happy family, as you can see here. And uh, this is just about uh, a year back. It just shows the kind of love and affection that we've been having over the last uh, 33 years. And he, uh, I invited him for the inauguration of my center in, uh, at the Glen Eagles Global, where the health secretary, Dr. Radhakrishnan, uh, inaugurated that. And uh, you can see that uh, he's there. And you can see three generations of, uh, of, of teachers and students, you know, Professor Arjun Das, he's the senior most living neurologist in the country now. He's 92, still practices. That is Professor Arjun Das. And Professor Pranesh trained under Professor Arjun Das. I trained under Professor Pranesh. And you can see that the three generations. And that's my wife, uh, Veena, who always accompanies me. Right? So now, and I dedicate this talk to my teacher, my guru, who's unfortunately not there with us, but I'm sure he's watching from, from above. And uh, so the talk is going to be like this, and this is a very provocative title, Do We Have a Brain? And that's because the heart has actually ruled the roost all these centuries, if you look. Now, if you look at, uh, you know, the symbol of the heart symbolizes so many things. You can see that right from, you know, uh, more than 2,500 years ago, where, you know, the heart symbolized, you know, so many uh, emotions. And uh, this is a British Museum piece of uh, the, 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 uh, of, of the symbol of the heart, the gold-plated symbol of the heart. And here you can see this lady giving a heart to a lover. And uh, that is the, it represents the emotion. So much so that, uh, you know, the uh, British, physiologist of the 17th century, Sir William Harvey, considered heart is the key or the sun of the body. I mean, that's so, it had such a kind of a, uh, the prime role it had played. And it also, he mentioned that it is the spiritual member of the body. And he also said that from the heart rises passion, 
anger, fear, terror, sadness, shame, delight, and joy. And no wonder that when we, you know, these are all very common uh, terminologies that we generally use. You know, if if we are, if something bad happens, we say we are heartbroken. Or if we have to express some empathy, we just say, you know, my heart goes out for you. And uh, heartfelt condolences is a very common uh, terminology when you want to express grief. And then obviously, you know, uh, passion and love, you know, the, my heart races when I see you. Or, and then, uh, you know, the, the head always, uh, you know, is a more kind of, is considered to be kind of a more logical kind of a, uh, an organ. But the heart is something that is more emotional. So these are uh, common terminologies. And uh, it continues even now. And, uh, you know, the emojis that you have, even in our WhatsApp, you know, you want to express love or you want to express something which is nice or good, you know, you have the heart symbol. And uh, that's how the heart has ruled the roost. So much so that even in death, you know, it's very interesting to know that the concept of death before 1960 was defined as a complete and irreversible cessation of spontaneous cardiac and respiratory function. So even up to 1960, it required the heart to stop or the breathing to stop. And only then you could consider somebody as dead. But then, you know, as the uh, understanding of brain function started improving in the last uh, 50 years or 60 years, then it became known that there is a, a condition where you can actually keep the heart going, the lungs going because of uh, artificial ventilation, and then you could keep the heart moving with, uh, you know, beating with uh, medication. But then the brain suffers if there's a problem. And therefore, this, the, 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 this, the Minnesota criteria, that's, that's what came out in 1971, which emphasize the importance of, you know, if, if there is a, an area of the brain which gets damaged, that produces irreversible loss of function in the brain, and that is enough to produce death, or enough to cause, or enough to say that this person is dead, even when the heart is beating, even when the lung is breathing. So that's the shift of the definition. So slowly, in the last 60 years, the transformation has taken place with the primacy from heart, it has come now back into the brain. And that's very, very interesting. And because, and because of that, that shift from the definition of death, it has spawned a, a new and a completely new uh, medical subspecialty. And, death, and then you can harvest all kinds of organs, right from the heart to the lung to the intestine to liver, kidneys, the whole host, bone, skin, you know, the eyes, anyway, were there right from the beginning. But this is something that has transformed the way in which we practice medicine. Just that concept of a shift in thinking that the heart is not the repository of, of emotion or the heart is not the repository of even life. Uh, uh, it is the repository of life, but it's not enough to, uh, to be responsible for death. You can keep the heart alive and the patient is still dead. And that concept has changed. Now, this is a very interesting point, And this is what we sometimes use when we are not sure whether the patient is actually dead or not. And we use what is called an angiogram. And we put a catheter into the, uh, into the neck vessels and we shoot it and you can see here that uh, this is the normal angiogram you can see that the dye is going in and it is nicely uh, outlining the brain blood supply very nicely and that's normal on the other hand if somebody is brain dead but has got good cardiac function you see the circulation is maintained because you can see that the dye is going up it's going up to the upper part of the neck but doesn't enter the skull so the brain is not perfused, so the brain is dead. The person is 
cardiac wise alive that at this point you can actually harvest organs and you don't have to wait for the irreversible cardiac death to take place so this is the state in which we kind of operate at this point and where we demonstrate there's no flow inside the brain then there's actually very nice blood pressure blood pressure may be quite normal and uh, therefore that's what it is but if you look back uh, around 2300 years ago it is this great man of the, the modern medicine and you see his definition of the brain function you see that uh, he just you see this the, the you can't get a better better description of how he kind of understood the function of the brain men not to know that from the brain and from the brain alone arise our pleasures our joy our laughter jests as well as our sorrows pain and grief and tears you see that the same emotions that william harvey said that it emanates from the heart <laughs> more than 2000 years ago hippocrates was <laughs> absolutely right through it in particularly we see here distinguish the ugly from the beautiful the bad from the good the pleasant from the unpleasant what a wonderful description and i hold and that's the last part of the definition which is very striking i hold that the brain is the most powerful organ in the human body therefore i assert that the brain is the interpreter of consciousness i mean you can't get a better definition of i mean he has encapsulated in this just one paragraph everything that the brain represents and and this is much before all your modern gadgetry that you can actually study these uh, events which i'll be now going into and then in india you find this very fascinating artifacts that you uh, uh, that we found uh, this is in the harappan uh, uh, civilization as well as in the eastern kashmiri civ uh, uh, areas these are you know skulls and you can see these very nicely made surgically made holes you can see that and so this is what is called trephination and they made very nice little holes in order to peer what is happening inside the brain not only that it's very interesting that you know there has been a what is called a craniotomy made and uh, this craniotomy requires you know a meticulous you know dissection of the skull bone and then replacement of the bone back and this patient is a, was alive and this is an anti mortem it's not a post mortem thing because the bone has healed the, the skull the, the fracture has healed which means that the person was alive when this person when this surgery was carried out so this is a very good example of our ancients who actually thought there's something there inside the head that that much is for sure now what it was and what they did with that we have no idea uh, this has been uh, dated to something like 2000 uh, years ago 2400 years ago and uh, this was a, a female aged about 25 or 30 that's what the aging of this brain of the skull is is extremely interesting now the understanding of the brain and its functions in the modern era began with this very uh, seminal uh, event that took place in 1848 on september 13th and this was a 27 year old gentleman called phineas gage who was a very meticulous hard working very very uh, you know uh, intelligent person who was working on the railway line uh, the laying of the railway line in the in the in new york city uh, uh, beside the hudson river and then there was a blast that took place and unfortunately for this gentleman what happened was the crowbar that he was holding uh, went in and it went in through the cheekbone and exited out from the you know from the top of the skull like that so it made a through and through entry through the brain and came out and he survived but unfortunately what happened to him subsequently was that he was no longer phineas gage his name was phineas gage but he was no longer the same person so after that traumatic brain injury he became a completely different man i mean a meticulous very hard working man became completely a different you know he was he became emotionally disturbed he became you know 
uh, irascible. He started uh, joking uh, uh, inappropriately. He behaved inappropriately. He developed a severe personality yeah, problem. Yeah. And then finally, he died yeah. at age 33, 36 uh, because of uh, continuous seizures. But whatever it is, this is what this particular gentleman then uh, you know, kind of, uh, they, they studied, you know, the personality of people. Now, how does the brain, you know, became completely changed within just uh, 24 hours. And he was he's no longer the same person. And that's when, that's what uh, spawned the study of, uh, you know, what are the functions of the brain. Now, uh, that's what the brain looks like. Uh, it's important. Uh, just, uh, this is, uh, the brain consists of two hemispheres uh, on either side. And that's connected to this, you know, thick wire, which is called the corpus callosum, which connects the two hemispheres. And then this is a very important structure. This is what is the brain stem. And at this point, which is called the medulla oblongata, this is where your respiratory center is, your blood pressure center is, your circulatory center is. And uh, during hanging, what happens is that when you hang, there's a fracture of this first vertebra and it goes and kinks this medulla oblongata and the person just dies instantaneously. So that's all. So you don't need any damage to the rest of the brain. You just go and kink that particular region and you're dead in a few minutes, in a few seconds actually. So you don't, uh, so that's, that's the importance of that. So this is the brain stem and uh, this is where, uh, this is from here, the projections of from here go and affect the rest of the brain like this. And uh, I must say that uh, these, this particular lobe, which is called the front, sisters, for example, from, from the Neanderthal man or from the chimpanzees, uh, the rest of the brain is actually there for the rest of the, for, for, for the chimpanzees and for our uh, earlier uh, hominoids. But the frontal lobe is much, much more developed in uh, Homo sapiens, which are uh, we humans. It's, it's three times the size of a hominoid or a Neanderthal man or a chimpanzee. And so this is what has made, you know, the man has uh, evolved from just being, uh, 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 you know, an animal to a more refined animal in terms of the ability to think, to judge, to, to have empathy, et cetera. So this is what happens to control over different uh, systems. So the frontal lobe is that, but this is the lobe, the, the, the uh, behind the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, this is the area which we perceive things. That is the, from the eye, uh, what you see the external world actually reaches this place. And this place then feeds into these regions. This is a very important region, this junction between these three lobes. This is where we process our imagery. So you see something and uh, then uh, you then make a, a judgment of what are you seeing. And uh, this is where it is. And the temporal lobe is the region which actually is the a repository of our memory. It's like our, you know, our hard drive, our memory stick. And that's where your memories are are stored predominantly on the left side, your verbal memory is stored on the right side, your visual memory is stored. And so therefore that's the kind of uh, function that we have. And it's very interesting to know that, you know, there are, you know, the nerve cells, which are the, uh, you know, the, that's the main thing where, which, which subserve all these functions. There are 90 billion of them. And these nerve cells connect to each other by, you see the number of, uh, the connections that it has, 150 trillion connections, and it weighs only about 1,400 grams, just 1.4 kilograms. 1.4 kilograms, but it requires or it consumes 25% of the total body circulation every minute. Now, that is a phenomenally staggering amount of blood that enters into the brain. Now, uh, imagine a 70 kilogram person who still has only a 1,400 gram brain but that 1,400 consumes about 25% of the total body volume. That is something, I mean, absolutely. That means that the brain is constantly requiring energy to function, even at rest. And that's a very, very interesting point that we cannot ignore. So that's why it, 
needs glucose, it needs circulation. That's the reason why when blood circulation reduces, the persons become confused. And when, you know, the classically when a diabetic, uh, you know, and has a hypoglycemic episode where the blood sugar drops down to less than 60, you know, they become confused, they become, uh, you know, they almost go into comatose state. And that's because that's, the brain requires a lot of energy. And that comes from glucose and from circulation. You can see that. Um, and then the brain communicates to the rest of the organ systems through uh, electromagnetic, predominantly electrical activity, which then also you know, generates magnetic uh, fields. And uh, from here, it controls every organ, including the heart. If the heart is racing, when you see some emotional stuff, it is not coming from the heart. The heart is just a recipient of activity. It's coming from the brain. The brain senses, oh yeah, this is something that is worth looking at and gets excited. And it, uh, the reaction to that excitement is an increase in the heart rate and palpitations that you have. So it's, everything is communicated to electricity and through an electro chemical it releases that electricity will release certain chemicals what are called neurotransmitters and this kind of changes back into electricity so there's a constant uh, tussle between uh, the elect neurotransmitters and the electrical activity so the electrical message moves through the body through these neurons and their connections and uh, that's what makes uh, supposing i want to move the right hand or the left hand you know and uh, that message uh, comes from the, and it, it starts working around that way, and then you are able to move the hand. Everything is done through electricity. So that's very important to remember. And in the modern era, you now this is in the 1946, as you can see here, from the Montreal Neurological Institute, the man who actually studied the brain in great detail through, you know, meticulous mapping of the various uh, functions of the brain. And you can see that he has mapped out, this is uh, 70 years ago, and you can see that, uh, you know, the different regions of the brain. Now, for example, in this region, it's observed the hand area, abdomen, the tongue. You can see that, uh, that this is the kind of mapping that has been done. The different responses to electrical stimulation of different parts of the brain. And I'll be showing you a little bit later on about that. And that's how they do that. You can see that, that they do that. So now in the modern era, now this is all these functions are now being able, you can actually do it non-invasively, majority of them. You can actually, you know, uh, you can use a magnet and this is what is called a transcranial magnetic stimulation. You can see this figure of brain coil. You can zap the brain by, you know, inducing a very strong magnetic current and then you can excite the brain or inhibit the brain depending on uh, uh, how you and then you can modify oh, brain activity, you can uh, you well. And, uh, this is another, you know, this is what is called uh, magnetoencephalography. You can actually map the various uh, activities that, kind of map that you get. You can place electrodes like this and then get a very nice electroencephalography like this. And uh, so you can study the electrical activity, the EEG. You can get uh, uh, the magnetic fields and you can get what is called the encephalography. And then you can expose the brain and place electrodes directly on the brain's surface and then record activity and or you can stimulate the brain in different ways and then you can elicit these responses. So these are some of the newer technologies that have come in the last 25 years or even less. And you can see that, you know, this is an epileptic activity coming from the left temporal region through magnetic fields and you can actually map out very accurately how the magnetic field is generated by the abnormal brain cells. And uh, you can see that the rest of the brain is fairly normal, but this is area which is actually abnormal. So you can very accurately nowadays map different things. Or you can do what is called the functional MRI and you couple it with the EEG and then you can map out different regions from where this electrical activity is maximally coming. You can then map it out very nicely by these kind of very attractive maps and you can say, okay, that's the region where the abnormal electrical activity is coming from. So this is a coupling of the EEG with the MRI and that's what is called the EEG functional MRI. And uh, these are the advances that you have multimodal imaging of the brain. All these things have come in the last 20 years or so. You have the structural MRI, some of the most powerful MRIs that you get. 
you can do what is called a SPECT, where you inject a dye, a radioactive dye, and then uh, see which areas of the brain are avidly taking it up, and then you see these hot spots, as what is called hot spot. Now, if, if an area is abnormal, there is an intake uptake of that radio tracer that you, you, you generate, you, you inject, and then you get that hot spot. And you know that, oh, that's the problem. On the other hand, you can uh, do a, what is called a positron emission tomography. You, you inject a radioactive glucose, and you study the glucose metabolism. And then you see that these red ones and the yellow ones are normal metabolism. And these dark green ones are low metabolism. You know that, okay, this area is hypometabolic. That means that area is abnormal. There's a functional abnormality. So you can actually, then you can do a, what is called a 3D surface rendering of that. You can create a brain model of that same person. This, this particular image has become like this now, what is called surface rendering. And then you can actually study the brain functions by what is called functional MRI, various functions like language, like motor activity, sensory activity, visual activity, memory paradigms. And then the latest way of doing that is doing what is called connections. I was telling about the connections between different parts of the brain, what is called tractography, the tracts of the brain can be mapped. Okay, this is how the visual cortex is connected to the front of the brain brain that is how we so you can actually study and compare it with uh, the other person and so on and so forth so this is what is called the multimodal imaging of the brain we are in a in a in an era now where you can actually understand the brain functioning extremely well now and uh, and this is what uh, this is my pet area of uh, what i do generally is what is called a stereo eg which is a you know you can this is the neuro navigation model and then you can use these trajectories. You can create these trajectories, avoiding the blood vessels on the brain surface. All this is done by the computer. So you can actually put these trajectories and then, in, then make these very tiny one millimeter, two millimeter holes. And then you can put these electrodes right inside the deepest parts of the brain. You can reach the deepest parts of the brain safely without producing any hemorrhage, without producing any damage to the, uh, the, the, the track that you create here. And then you can actually study, you can put multiple electrodes, you can put about 10 to 15 or 20 electrodes on one side or the other side on both sides and then study the brain function and uh, so on and so forth. Now, I'm going to come into these very exciting new, this is all happening in the last 10 to 12 years. We are understanding what happens when you're just simply resting. You know, if you're just, you know, imagine uh, on a Sunday morning, you're just sitting uh, in a very pleasant uh, environment and you're just watching the, you know, you're just daydreaming, basically. You're just uh, taking in whatever is coming in front of you. You're not thinking actively or you may just be, you know, kind of uh, imagining the past or, you know, okay, imagining the future or thinking about the past. That's nothing more than that. And you see that at that time, what happens is this is what is called a default mode network. This is what happens when we are just daydreaming. And you see the amount of activity that is taking place in this region, which is at the parietal lobe. And these are the regions, this is what is called a resting state default mode network. This is the network that is active when you're not doing anything. And that's a very interesting part. And then, and you can see that the hippocampus, that's the area of our memory. So, you know, you may be just thinking, oh, yeah, I met Murli, you know, oh, yeah, you know, two years back, oh, that was wonderful. You know, I'm just thinking, that's it. I'm not actively, you know, kind of, but I'm just uh, uh, enjoying the past or I may, you know, plan something about the future or maybe I should be doing something like that. So that's the time when this resting state fMRI uh, will look. But then, you know, when you're resting and then suddenly you think, okay, I should now be doing something better now. And then I start thinking, okay, I must now do something more constructive. So that's the time when, you know, this default mode network from resting state, it gets deactivated and it activates another center that's called the salience network. So if you have three or four projects and you decide, okay, I'm going to do one of them. So the salience comes into the picture, which means that I'm going to ignore the other three. I'm going to concentrate on this one and feeds into what is called the central executive network. Now the dorsal, this is the, this is the region of the brain, the frontal region and the outside of it, no, not in the midline, not in the middle, 
but on the outside that is our most important uh, region which requires for planning for future and that's what is called the social executive network and it has to constantly communicate with the conscious center which is at the back of the head it's very important so you're consciously thinking and planning and judging okay is this project going to be good uh, the the logistics part of it the logical aspects of it the logical brain resides here and that's very important and that has to constantly interact with the conscious brain which is here and so the logical brain and the conscious brain constantly interacts and at that time you're not in a default mode <laughs> the default mode is in this inactivated or deactivated and this is how the brain keeps shifting from daydreaming to and uh, as i was mentioning that uh, you know the frontal lobe is the more logical brain the judgmental brain but these areas are very crucial for us to understand what is happening the conscious appreciation of our environment our uh, uh, you know the sights the smells the uh, everything else that happens around us without this you are nowhere uh, there's no point in having uh, you know there's no conscious brain which is functioning if there is a damage to this region so that's very very what's the role of the brain when you meditate or you know what's the role of brain in religion or spirituality and so on and so forth and now you can actually study these things with these techniques and you can see here that this is a spect image during meditation and you see that your this is the conscious brain and uh, this is the right side of that uh, conscious brain which the right uh, parietal lobe which is the the back of that that is responsible for our orientation to space and time and uh, that is a very very interesting and an important point it gets deactivated so you are deactivating your consciousness when you meditate when you go into deep into meditation it gets deactivated you do not know where you are and the same thing happens with prayer when you get deep into prayer the orientation of yourself to the environment gets deactivated so you are in a zone of spacelessness and timelessness is a very very and now you have proof for it because you know we keep listening to you know uh, you know some of these uh, the, uh, the the spiritualists and they, they keep telling you know we are in a different zone now you know why they are in a different zone because you have proof for it and uh, it's very very interesting and so the more you pray and the more you, you meditate you know you can get out of the conscious zone and get into a, an area of timelessness and spaceless spacelessness and that's very important and when you have deep religious beliefs uh, you uh, it, it tends to activate a certain part of the brain which is uh, what is called the nucleus accumbens and this is and this is the, the medial frontal region and this is this absentees this is very interesting and this is across different religions and uh, you find that there's a you know deep activation of this region if you have if you are a quite a religious uh, believer and a non believer somehow doesn't get activated there so you can actually distinguish your i mean by looking at that you know your the, the connections the neural connections of an atheist is different from the neural connection of a religious believer so that's very interesting so you could probably uh, you know uh, use these uh, models and then you see the difference between you saw that in meditation what happens in meditation is that you go into a zone of timelessness and uh, spacelessness that means your posterior head region is uh, getting deactivated but the yoga does the opposite and i was just telling you that uh, you know the this is the central executive network which requires logical thinking and planning and you know that kind of the executive work that is required and you see that as you do better and better when you get better and better at yoga these regions the central executive network becomes very strong so you become much better in your managerial entrepreneurial skills and you have proof for it now and that's a very very interesting these are uh, 
that's a, a PET study and that's an fMRI study of people who underwent uh, yogic practice for about eight weeks, 12 weeks. You can see the difference already happening very clearly that there's a very strong activation of the central executive network areas. And that's how you're, you become better as a person. And that's very important. Now, coming to anger and aggression. Now, these are all, you know, emotional response. And you see that anger is usually a negative emotional response. If you think that somebody is blocking you, or if you think that somebody is behaving unfairly to you, you know, you become angry. And that's what happens. But aggression is different because aggression is that your action is intended to cause harm to somebody else. So that's the difference between the two. And uh, well, yeah, and that's what it is. And, and you see that uh, uh, this is the region, the amygdala, that's the region which subserves anger. And uh, there are people who are very impulsive. They're very angry. They have very lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, activation of that particular region. So you calm down that region, you become less angry. And that's one of the reasons why you can actually, when you do meditation, you can actually reduce that activation here. And you can reduce the activation of these regions, which are responsible for our aggressive outlook. And you can actually calm down the brain over time. And uh, you can actually study these things by doing uh, fMRIs over time. And then there's a very And you feel the pain. And that's what is called empathy. And it's an extremely interesting thing to know that, you know, you feel the, the other person's pain as much as the other person is feeling. And that is the role of what is called mirror neurons. All of us have got some amount of mirror neurons, which means that what uh, emotion the other person experiences, you also experience almost the same thing. You're mirroring the other person. And uh, this has been studied accidentally in monkeys you know when a monkey when one monkey was reaching out the monkeys had implantable electrodes in the brain and they gave food to one monkey and that monkey grabbed that food but the other monkey who was not given food was not actually grabbing that food you know the same region which the monkey which was grabbing the food the same region in the monkey which was just looking at the food it got activated the same region and that is how this role of mirror neurons and that is how humans build empathy. It's a social network and that happens. And that's what is very, very interesting. And there are certain regions of the brain that have these mirror neurons. And these mirror neurons is now spawning a new, uh, this thing where telepathy, uh, we all know that, you know, having uh, grown up in India where, you know, there's a lot of these mysticism and uh, people believe in telepathy and things like that. And this is a very recent uh, uh, study. You know, a person sitting in Bom Mumbai, and another person sitting in Madrid, in Spain, and this is a Mumbai patient, person, normal person, and this is a fellow sitting in Madrid, and he imagines a word, hello, and that imagined word is converted into an EEG signal, and that EEG signal is transmitted through the internet, and it goes to this person who's sitting in Madrid, and that EEG signal is converted into a transcranial magnetic stimulator, which is stimulating his visual cortex. That visual cortex, so that that EEG signal is converted into phosphines. And this fellow reads that same letter, what this fellow imagined this fellow could read. So that is the power of telepathy. So telepathy is actually real. And there's evidence for it. And uh, it's a very interesting uh, project. And it's, this happened in about 2016. So now is the era where you'll actually be studying all these things. And you see that this is a study that was done in Nimans. You see, what they did was, uh, this is an investigator. So the investigator who's making, who's studying this telepathy, he, he sits in one room, he draws this particular thing. You know, it's a very random uh, kind of a drawing, you know, this kind of a drawing. And there are two other people who are sitting in different rooms. One is this telepathic mentalist. He's supposed to read other people's mind. <laughs> okay. And so, and this person, the investigator draws this and just gives, you know, vague clues. Like, you know, they're just some few lines. That's all he says. Nothing more than that. 
there are a few lines that's what he says and and that's it this telepathic mentalist is able to imagine and read this fellow's mind and he draws almost something very similar at least parts of it is quite similar there's about 80 percent match <laughs> right whereas a less gifted person the control who had no telepathic uh, mentalist uh, faculties now he just draws you know he's got a clue and then he just draws a few lines like that and you can see that you know this is very striking and they, then they did the functional MRI and in this telepathic fellow it activated his hippocampus there that is the region on the other hand the control fellow he just uh, activated only that logical brain nothing more than that here this is a, a region which has a lot of mirror neurons and he probably used his mirror neurons to understand what the other person is actually doing it's a very fascinating study this is in 2016 you know it's going to increase now the these studies which are going to happen and then uh, a very last two very important points grief when somebody when you lose somebody you know uh, you lose and then you know we go into what is called a grief reaction and uh, that's natural everybody you know you lose a loved one and then uh, there is a grief reaction most of us get over it over time uh, but there are some people who just cannot get over it even after a year you know they have recurrent pangs of painful emotions intense yearning and longing and searching for the disease they just take you know they just can't get over it and preoccupation with thoughts for the loved one and that keeps on going so that's what is called a complicated grief as opposed to just a normal kind of a grief reaction that's quite normal and when they did the functional mri of these complicated grief patients it activated the same center that i'll be talking about which gets activated during addiction if you are an alcoholic addict it activates this that means you are yearning for it you're longing for something and that is the region which is called the yearning and the longing center or the reward center you you you're yearning for it you want it you want something very desperately that's what it is so the complicated grief <laughs> reaction comes from that region which is what is called the yearning center and that is the same as the addiction pathway which is this pathway which is interesting and you see that when when somebody drinks a lot of alcohol and uh, that uh, and then likes to have another drink and that's what again the same same region which uh, <laughs> which got activated during the complicated uh, grief will get activated you show them a fearful face normally what happens is if a fearful face is shown in a normal person a certain uh, this this particular region gets activated but if you show a fearful face to a person who is now nicely you know drunk alcohol and uh, you know you, you show the same fearful face it doesn't appear fearful at all for the person so that's why alcohol has got some anxiolytic effect and so they don't really bother about what is happening in front of them because they just don't care about it and that's because it engages different networks and that's extremely interesting now you can actually kind of empathize with these alcoholics who kind of you know it's unfortunate that they have this very high reward center uh, activation so if you see that nowadays uh, what is happening is in teenagers they're doing the studies uh, especially in the u.s where time in as early as 17 or 18 year old uh, people they know that okay with this kind of activation they're definitely going to become alcoholics and that's something that you can actually then train even much before center that uh, is responsible for that transformation the same thing with cocaine addicts and that's the same center which gets activated in a normal control it doesn't happen so even if you take snort a few cocaines if you're not an addict no nothing happens but if you're an addict that's the region so you know these are what are called reward centers and they play both ways grief extreme grief or extreme satisfaction so so that's the same region it's extremely interesting and then the final part of this 
is this what a tremendous project that has started off in 2010 and completed in 2016 we now have using some of the most powerful MRIs and now they're going to crack these conditions, autism, Alzheimer's, dyslexia, schizophrenia, memory, self-control, decision-making. This is what is called a connectome project, how brain areas get connected to each other. They've done it on 1,200 people, normal persons, and they're studying the brain act. You know, these are the uh, wires that connect different regions and people with different connections uh, where there's variable connections that leads on to autism or that leads on to schizophrenia and all those kind of things are very, very, so you see these kind of maps that are coming out now in the last two years or so, it's amazing. And uh, we are going to get involved in this project because we are, we are going to start some uh, thing on this autism. I'm going to show you one of my patients who's what is called a autistic servant. And this boy, is a 10 year old or 11 year old boy who has no verbal skills, not much at all, nothing. He doesn't have social skills, but you just see what he does. Uh, I hope the video is playing. I'm giving a number, a very complex number. 5693 into 73. It's a very complex number for this boy who has no social skills. Now you just see. See, he's going to now tell you the answer for that very complex number. You'll have to, because he's got a short attention span. See that he's pointing out. I've given a six digit number multiplication 5673 into 73 or something like that. You see that? This is I calculated. And he pointed it out exactly. Mind read. See, the mother is telling. You see, this boy has got a special skill, an exceptional skill in mathematical calculations. But he has absolutely no social skills. He doesn't have verbal skills. He cannot um, mingle with others because he's an autistic, but he's got one faculty which is extremely well developed. And that is interesting. And uh, you see this mother who now tells about, uh, and he has also got a precise. You see this. See that? So he could uh, he could foresee an accident. So he's got uh, special skills. He is able to anticipate and foresee an event that takes place. See the boy, you see that the boy, he's got hyperactivity, he can't sit in one place. He's, uh, so, you know, with that kind of a special skill, if he was a normal chap, I mean, I don't know, he would have become a multi-millionaire by now because he could predict different things. He would probably predict what's going to happen to the elections of Donald Trump. Uh, so, so that's the kind of thing that I wanted to. Um, now I'm going to show you a few videos. I hope I'm, uh, should I stop at this point or uh, is it all right if I continue for another 10 minutes? President, is it okay for 10 minutes? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. We are enjoying oh, it. Uh, we are enjoying it. Okay. Enjoying I'll uh, it. just uh, another 10 minutes. I'm going to show you some 
very interesting. You see, the, I was telling about the frontal lobe, the front of the brain, uh, which is a very complex thing. And then when it gets uh, excited by electrical activity, abnormal electrical activity, it generates what are called epileptic seizures. And you will never believe that these are actually seizures because they don't look like the classical epileptic fits that we commonly know of. And uh, I'll just uh, show you a few examples of that. You see this, you see this boy. Yeah. Now, will you, nobody will ever imagine that this person, is, this is actually an epileptic seizure that is happening. So he's actually drumming and it comes all of a sudden. And simultaneously doing the EEG. Yeah, so that is one. So this is an abnormal behavior. And then he smiles. And then he does this kind of what are called motor stereotypes. You know, it's a stereotyping movements. And he's got the emotion that is involved. And then he becomes all right. You see that? So that is a, a seizure. You see, this is another type of, you see the funny expressions that these people can have. Unfortunately, you know, they, it comes all of a sudden. You see this gentleman, I'm doing his EEG simultaneously. You see this. They don't look like epilepsy, but they are epileptic seizures. And they come from the frontal lobe. So that's what it is. So you can see how uh, funny the, and then you can get extreme fear. So she becomes normal. It's only, only about 10 seconds of intense fear. And that's a seizure, an epileptic seizure. She's normal otherwise. And you see this very funny, what, what happens in sleep uh, for this person. And uh, almost every day he has these problems in sleep. And for that, you see that? Uh, these kind of what are called repetitive stereotyping motor moments in sleep. And uh, you see this? It doesn't look like epileptic seizures, but they are actually epileptic seizures. All of them we have operated on. And they have got cured. And uh, these are very funny seizures looking. You can see that. It's very, very interesting. You know, very, very unusual kind of epileptic seizures. So anything that is uh, short lasting and very funny and abnormal, maybe epileptic seizures, maybe coming from the frontal lobe. And so that is uh, what it is. And sometimes we have to deal with, you know, you see, this, this is the functional MRI where the speech area is there and she's got a lesion there. And uh, we have to operate and the seizures are coming from there for this young girl, 14, 15 year old girl. Every day she gets about several attacks where the hand becomes a bit stiff and she kind of uh, slowly falls off. And uh, she's getting it about seven or eight or 10 times a day. And you see that the arm is becoming stiff and it's coming from this region. But this region is also a language area. So we have to preserve the language area and uh, we have to, so we preserve the language is that we want to study that that's what is called a stereo EG implantation you actually put those electrodes right inside and uh, you study the network and then uh, you find that and then uh, we do the uh, you know the stimulation on the table now that's that's the scene normally how it looks and this is the stimulator that you have that's the brain uh, that's the surgeon that's the whole team and uh, this is how we generally do the studies and then you can actually map out. You see that uh, I will show you that I'm st we are stimulating the brain surface. And then you see the response. You see the hand movement that happens now as we are putting some small current. And you see that uh, the hand is moving. So that means that you are very close to the hand area. And that is where the hand area is. So you can be so accurate and uh, on the table and you can map out the and you can keep the patient awake we are actually operating and we are removing that area and uh, this person we have kept her awake during the surgery and uh, see i am testing her language function 
during the operation. This is what is called an awake uh, operation. We are testing the language function. And then uh, we do that. And then we resect only this part. And this is the language area surrounding it. So we have to be very, very accurate. If you go one millimeter this side and damage this, she's going to have a permanent language deficit. And she's normal. You see that this is a year later. You can't make out that she has underwent this stereo EG and then those that, and she's completely normal. So, and uh, you can actually study various parts of the brain. Now, this is uh, an electrode. I was telling about that electrode that goes in right like this. These are the electrode contacts. And I'm now stimulating these uh, two regions with putting a current. And I'm stimulating also those regions. And you can see the response. Uh, see this gentleman next describing what he feels. You see, and now I put the current there. And he says, oh, he's got some, you see. So he feels as if some chloroform cloud is escaping from his nose. And that's the function of that particular region of the brain. So like that, we map out. You see, now I'm going to stimulate another region of the brain, uh, which is controlling his hand. Okay, so that is uh, the same thing. And now you see. Yeah, he feels something funny, a current, a current is passing in his left hand. Yeah. So you can actually, you know, keep these people for several days and then stimulate different parts of the brain and study their function and then come to the conclusion as to where it's coming from. So, uh, so I think this is uh, impossible without uh, a, a team of dedicated people. So I think uh, uh, that's my team, uh, the, uh, the surgeons, the physicians, the neurologists, and all other people. So thank you very much for your patient uh, listening. I don't know whether uh, I bored you or I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry about it, but I hope it was uh, useful. Thank you so much. Hey Dinesh, first Thank of you. all, uh, I'll have to tell you that uh, it was worth a wait for a week because uh, I asked you a very simple question, do we have brains with the what little I had, thinking that it's going to be like you will be saying that whether I have one or I don't have one. I didn't realize that we will be on this uh, stage. The second thing is that I have given a talk in, uh, in this Rotary, but okay. I never had the... Uh, a fortune of having the first president and but uh, he said okay your classmate is more illustrious so let me be on your talk oh. <laughs> so he's, he's there on, on your talk he's not on my talk so that's a that's something that i will settle scores with him later the um, one thing that I was always hoping for in your presentation, Dinesh, before we move to questions is, you have done so much of mapping and I would have really loved to have seen mapping of politicians to see <laughs> they are actually different in their head compared to all the others. So that is a, that is a serious uh, uh, question that I wanted to ask you. I, uh, okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, I, I can imagine I can imagine that uh, the areas that are uh, the networks that uh, subserve empathy won't be there <laughs> Good one. Good one. so I have uh, two more points and then I will leave the I will open the floor for questions here so one of the things uh, Dinesh we normally see if you remember in good old days is this is what we do for the yeah. The frontal side, which is called uh, in a very colloquial term, which is called the player kotu, as they call yeah. it. So, uh, seeing your map, I was wondering, does. I, and I, you know, if you look at, you know, what happens when you do yoga and then, you know, you see the central executive network, which is on the outside of the lateral part of the frontal lobe. And uh, probably it's an acknowledge. It, it, it probably activates that when you do this. I I think it may be. <laughs> it's it's a good point. See these studies, and I think now uh, people are now studying these different uh, 
beliefs and uh, and all these uh, you know rituals and all those things it's going to come out in the next 5 10 years this is the kind of data that we want we really want to document and 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 support the kind of uh, studies that you can actually do with these fmris you don't need to put electrodes directly into the brain now you have these fmris you can do that yeah good point so two questions to you uh, and then the floor is uh, for the others first question is how Quickly, are we going to download the brains of people? Because that is something that uh, even Stephen Hawking was talking about. Google is working on it. There's uh, several people uh, who think that uh, a person's brain can be sort of downloaded. Like we do on. Do everything except probably sell perfumes. Because you can't sell perfumes because nobody can smell it. I mean, that is just not going to be on. <laughs> so the uh, one of the projects that is going on in the Silicon Valley that I heard a talk was that you will have an electrical impulse like you showed here, yeah. which will actually simulate the uh, uh, to the neurons the way you are uh, f feeling the chemicals stimulate and that conduct that is conducted back here. Yeah. So people do um, are working on those very advanced sure. areas where you touch a mouse, you will be able to smell uh, perfume. It's going to come. It's, it's definitely going to come. And this uh, downloadability is already uh, kind of happening. And, um, and uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, most of our conscious uh, energies are stored in what are called microtubules within neurons. And uh, this microtubular consciousness is is downloadable and they are working on that particular part of it and i think in the next uh, 10 years or so you will probably be seeing uh, you know murli and uh, you know murli's thoughts <laughs> could probably be uh, could be read by any other you will have all the oh, people on oh, the... Yes. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm sorry about it. Yeah, correct, correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now you're having everybody. The floor is open to questions. Please uh, uh, unmute one after the other and you're welcome to go ahead with the questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Doctor. I'm Ramesh Bhakna here. Yeah, I have a small... Uh, yeah, I... Yeah, make this work. Yes. Uh, yeah. I have a small question. And you were talking about like all the uh, communication mm -hmm. the body is through electrical and electromagnetic mm -hmm. uh, impulses. And in our environment today, we have a lot of these environmental uh, impulses of electrical and electromagnetic. So how does that affect the body? Uh, that's a, it's, it's a very, very good point. Uh, but the thing is, you see the strength of the overall electromagnetic uh, um, Uh, the you know if you want to actually disturb a part of the brain you need to use a very high magnetic field very close to the brain area. and that's what that uh, coil is the, the figure of eight coil and uh, that requires a very high magnetic current oh, sorry able to perturb or alter the way in which the neurons uh, change uh, the general magnetic field uh, that uh, we are exposed to really doesn't have that much of an effect as much. So I think at the moment, no. No, I think we are pretty safe. Uh, but I think uh, with the cell phones and all that, doing, people have shown that, uh, you know, the chances of getting a tumor in the, of the eighth nerve is there. Uh, the jury is still out. I think yeah. there's a strong, I mean, if, if, if it really is true, I think the industry uh, would have a, a role to play because they would uh, not like they would like to suppress that uh, information because yeah. then it will go it will get destroyed. Yeah. So so the, I think there is evidence that uh, it can produce very close you know radio frequency waves can change the way in which the nerves will uh, function. So that's right. I, I, it has a role, and the powerful uh, magnetic changes that take place uh, during the lunar and uh, the the changes uh, during the high tide and the low tide does have a, an effect on the mood. You know, people become moody. For example, uh, you, you take, for example, in, uh, in the Western world, you know, in the Northern Hemisphere, where the winters are very long and the winters are really, you know, where the days are very short and the nights are long, there's a, what is called a seasonal affective disorder. 
you know, that environment or the, the climatic uh, change has a profound impact on, uh, on the mood. And people become very depressed. And that's what is called seasonal affective disorder. The same thing is true during uh, certain phases of uh, the lunar uh, cycle. And uh, what happens is it has an impact, but that impact will be there for a few hours or a few, you know, one or two days. And that's what happens. So it does have a role. I mean, we are, after all, part of the cosmos. And every energy that we have is actually part of the bigger uh, picture. So definitely the environment has a role to play. To what extent and uh, how much? Yes. Yeah, Dr. Lakshmipati, sir, please go ahead. Oh, sir. <laughs> how are you? Yeah. Or uh, let me say that. <laughs> I want, yes, I want to ask you, uh, Dinesh. The yes. first question to ask, answer morally: Is there any particular part of the frontal cortex that gives one capabilities with the computer? Because obviously, mine has been replaced by fibrosis, and so I can't. I can't <laughs> at all work a computer. The day morally spoke, I wanted to get into this. But then I could not organize a, um, this kind of a meeting, like you see. And that's the problem. It is no insult to Murali, whose speaking abilities I greatly admire. And this, uh, my question is, uh, Dinesh, wonderful. You have given a lovely talk. And I think you should give one whole afternoon for questions and answers. The question is, is there any connection? You know, some people are supposed to be reincarnated. You know, some people who are extraordinarily capabilities in one direction. You know, they're able to recall the so-called their previous birth and all Absolutely. that. And there are a number of instances like this. So have any studies been done to prove that this is a possibility? So that, you know, then we're going to have a big upper hand saying that we are the first people who talk about Excellent, sir. Excellent. Uh, now, the, uh, this particular study is going on in the PGI in Chandigarh where Professor Vivek Lal, he's got a special interest in this particular field and he has got a collection of six interesting, you know, the person who dies in Punjab and then, uh, you know, another chap sitting in UP, being exactly the same way as this uh, person, and uh, he's got a collection of six families like that. Yes. And, uh, and mm -hmm. it's, it is very much in evidence. It is there. It's a real phenomenon. They are now doing uh, psycholo new psychological studies on these, uh, these, uh, these six uh, pairs that are there. And I think uh, in the next few, uh, maybe one or two years, it's going to come out, sir. There's no doubt about it. Oh. And, and this is... It's extremely interesting. What happens when somebody, you know, leaves the world, uh, the soul or whatever it is, the Atman, uh, is actually represented in the microtubules and it becomes part of the, the cosmos and it has to enter into some other uh, body. It has to do that. It, it, um, yeah. And then that is the reason why uh, if, and, and all these six, and all these six have had sudden Accidental deaths. Ah, yes. And that's a very, very striking thing. They're all young. They're not, you know, in the all the six, the people who died were in their twenties, late twenties, early thirties, and they died sudden calamitous deaths, you know, accidental deaths, violent deaths, and they almost instantaneously, you know, they have taken birth in another place, completely different, different religions. In fact, Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So he's got a collection of that. So hey, his, hey. his findings are that you know, violent death, pretty uh, not very old, and uh, that's what it's very true, sir. It's, it's yes. there. I have, read, I have read some of these cases. That's why I was fast. Paramahamsa's trances and people like that is only some kind of a temporal lobe epilepsy. Yeah, that's actually, true. yes. Uh, so there are books written on this. 
So is, are these people only getting into an epileptic state and calling it a trance? Or is there any evidence that it is something supernatural? Uh, ecstatic epileptic seizures are well known and they go into a state of trance and, uh, and it can prolong. And in fact, there are a group of people whom Penfield himself had studied. You stimulate uh, the uh, posterior hippocampus yes. and then they go into an intense religious uh, kind of an experience. They say that, you know, I can see God. I mean, if you can't describe what more, they can't describe more than that. They suddenly get into such a... Uh, Ecstasy. Uh, you know... Uh, ecstatic. They become ecstatic. And they yes. just find joy. And they can't describe anything more than that. There's a smile and that. And they just experience it. The cerebral orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question? Any other question, yeah. please? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, yeah, raise, right. your, raise your hands, please, so that it's easy to identify. Yeah. Yeah. Ram Ramesh Bhakna here. Uh, Ramesh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have spoken a lot about uh, the brain activation and the mm -hmm. brain, uh, how it works. But uh, specific to our, uh, our, our club, the Rotary Central, where the average group is uh, age is around plus 70 plus. So I'm, I'm also about 60 plus, of course. So uh, can you tell something about uh, the aging and the aging of the brain? They, oh, say, yeah. they say that heart does not age, but the brain ages. Well, the heart and, uh, the heart and uh, is, well, that's yeah, a very good point. The reason why the heart uh, does not age, the heart aging is basically directly or almost directly related to the blood supply. Uh, because the heart cells are generally muscular cells. They have their own uh, muscular contractility and that's what they, it's supposed to do. But even that, actually, as you age, uh, it, 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 the contractility starts coming down a little bit, but it is much stronger than uh, the other organs. There's no doubt about it. That's why it uh, lasts. But it's directly related to the blood supply. The brain also is directly related to the blood supply, but the brain is more complex than that. Uh, the reason is that uh, the internal structure of the cells, the neurons that I was talking about, which now those get degenerated uh, over time. And uh, the all those the 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 skeletal the cytoskeletal structure of a, a neuron gets altered, and uh, the proteins that are there inside they get hardened, and that are what are called senile plaques. They develop, and they slowly destroy the cell. So you know, every day we lose about you know one million neurons every day. Apoptosis. That means the cell which is there is programmed to die at a certain point. It can die prematurely also because of other reasons, but it is, dies naturally. That's how we age. But, and that is directly related to what is called telomer, telomer length of the gene. And now there are projects that are going on, and that's what is called uh, the project, what is called, Im, uh, what is got, uh, uh, what is that, uh, uh, immortality what is called the Project Gilgamesh, which is uh, a, an emperor in uh, the BC who thought that, who wanted to be, you know, immortal forever, but he didn't, uh, he, he refused to go off. Maybe a year or so, clung on to the body. So this particular project is called Project Gilgamesh, and they're going to alter the way in which I'm sure that the next 15, 20 years, we are able to did. So I, it's all, it's going to be reality. And that's scary because people who can afford will become immortal. People who can't afford, well, so again, it's going to be a, an unequal world where uh, you'll have a, you know, haves and the have-nots. So people can choose to die, people can choose to live. Uh, so it's going to happen. It is a reality. This project Gilgamesh is well on the way. And there is no doubt about it that in the next 20 years, a few humans will decide when they are going to die. This is going to happen. It is a reality. 
Okay, the next question is from uh, Mr. Bharat Shah, and then we have the next question from uh, uh, Sachin Kotecha. Yeah, uh, this is uh, like uh, Doctor. I had read this book uh, by Doctor. Brian Weiss. Uh, many lives, many masters. If you have read it, he is a psychiatrist in the U.S. Yes, and yes. I have not read he, it, but I know about it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, so he takes one of his patient to the in the past life regression through hypnosis and yes. actually cures it. And yes. he takes her to the level like I mean, she goes back, uh, you know, one after the other lives. She goes back to the Stone Age. Wow! So this was uh, like uh, something like you know, uh, and a lot of uh, uh, what I read from that book was uh, like the way we have in Hinduism, like we have you know rebirth and all that. Again, reaffirming our Hindu beliefs and all that. That's, so, uh, that's remarkable. That's remarkable. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I think the Hinduism has got so much of rich, uh, you know, understanding of not just the brain. But uh, the understanding of consciousness, timelessness, and uh, it is the one thing, the, the philosophy which says that we are only a part of the cosmos, which we are now realizing. <laughs> we always were telling that, that we are part of the cosmos, we are just one with it. And, uh, and, and we are just, you know, we are just vibrations in the same space. And this is exactly what uh, has been brought out in this, correct? It's, it's a very good point. Sachin, next question. Yeah, good evening, doctor. Yeah, uh, good evening. Yeah, this is yeah. Sachin here. Yeah. Uh, beautiful uh, presentation and uh, I mean, wish you all the best in the unraveling the mysteries of this great brain. Uh, my simple question is, like, you know, a human being has got a lot of limitations. Some may be, uh, you know, he wants to develop some talent. So, normal ways, Going into that, practicing and develop the talent, or some are born, bondly, I mean, gifted like that. Then there'll there'll be limitations like memory, uh, memory power. Some may have, may not. I, some may want to develop some skill. Is it possible to develop those things through surgical uh, procedure or the traditional? Uh, no, not. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, not through surgical procedure. Yeah, through surgical procedure, no doubt. Uh, there's another thing which is happening. Uh, there are two ways of doing that. This is a field called neuromodulation. In other words, you need to modulate certain areas of the brain. Uh, you can modulate the way in which that particular region is going to work. For example, that uh, reward center that I was talking about, the nucleus accumbens. Mm -hmm. Now that can be modulated. <laughs> magnetic stimulation. You don't even have to enter the brain. You locate that PMS and then start firing. You give uh, several sessions like that. You are going to modulate the uh, brain activity so that you know you can either enhance something or you can reduce the effects of uh, the overactivity. So that's a very good point. So this is a whole field of what is called neuromodulation, and it can be done. Yes. Okay, uh, now the next question is uh, from uh, Manoj, I guess. You wanted to ask a question, Manoj? Uh, Dinesh, this is Manoj here. Yeah. Hi, yeah. hey, Manoj. <laughs> How are you? Good to see you. So, I, I have a question. It's a sports, sports related question. Uh, there's so much of study which is happening in the uh, field of sports. Is it possible uh, to actually uh, study a person who, who's interested in sports or wanted, wants to do well in sports, whether it's possible to evaluate him, whether he has it in him to go further or accomplish uh, sports? Is it possible? Excellent point. Uh, but uh, I am not aware at, as of now. I don't know whether there are any ongoing uh, studies uh, in that uh, direction. But as of now, no. I think people are more concentrating on, uh, you know, behavioral uh, changes. Uh, for example, crime. Now, there's a big study in uh, Chicago that's going on. You know, Chicago is a crime city. It's very easy to get, uh, you know, uh, populations of, uh, you know, subjects who are prone to crime. And so that's the kind of studies that are going on. And uh, they have found certain patterns. Uh, in those people who are prone to commit crimes and versus those who are not. And so I'm sure that uh, this is going to definitely uh, 
definitely this this group is going to be studied but i am not aware at the moment whether any such uh, studies are uh, there if i am if if i come across i'll i'll definitely try and uh, do that now i will and then if so i'll communicate with you yeah uh, thank you gentlemen uh, just one question one problem here is that uh, anybody who wants to have a repeat question kindly wait because i see a lot of uh, people want to ask questions so please bear with me i will definitely grab uh, Uh, Mr. Uh, 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 our Dr. Dinesh Naik once again someday to answer specific queries. Uh, but uh, you know, as an agent, I will try to collect some money without your knowledge, Dinesh, uh, so that you consult this. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think uh, the junior Kemka wants to ask a question, so please go ahead, uh, Yashish. You are your question. That is. Yeah, Yashish, you are muted. Did he hear Ashish? He wanted to ask a question. Yes. Yes. Uh, Uh, hello, doctor. It was a wonderful session. Yeah. Uh, I have reading this book uh, called *Sapiens* by Yuval Noah Harari. Yeah. And uh, wherein he talks about the cognitive revolution after yes. which we have the agricultural revolution. Yes. So my question is more about uh, the augmentation revolution that is going on right now. Um, yes. So uh, suppose uh, one person who couldn't uh, feel and touch. Uh, in the cognitive revolution started uh, analyzing things uh, and uh, you know having uh, beliefs in god that he had not seen so are we moving into an age wherein you know uh, we'll be into an uh, really into an augmented world and augmented reality yeah uh, de definitely we are still evolving uh, in that direction and uh, it will definitely happen and uh, you will uh, know as a uh, Is a is a is a fantastic historian. He's got some very good uh, points to make, and his own theories about you know how uh, the Homo sapiens have become Homo sapiens, and uh, from uh, agricultural revolution to cognitive and to the scientific revolution, and uh, and so on and so forth. And maybe uh, at some point uh, we may not be the same human beings that we are now at the moment, and we are going to change in in, in ways that are completely. Uh, Uh, unknown at the moment you can't even imagine uh, how we are going to change in the next few so augmented reality is uh, reality actually so it's going to happen it will happen uh, but you know history has always taken unexpected turns over so you if you imagine something happening and then all of a sudden at one point you'll come to a crossroads where you think that you will know and that uh, uh, very nice uh, uh, you know that could be some unexpected twist and then it can uh, may not happen also so yes that's true it's a good okay, point so two good more point. two more questions so the next question is dr prakash yes sir uh, what about i'm um, dr prakash the word about uh, oxytocin Yeah, love, love hormone. Yeah, yeah. I I didn't touch upon the uh, the the hormonal uh, or the the neurotransmitter to that extent, but uh, we all live with you know multiple neurotransmitters. But some of the most important uh, neurotransmitters are uh, you know the or what are called the the neurotransmitters of of happiness, love, and uh, reward, and uh, one is dopamine one is um, serotonin and one is oxytocin so these are extremely important and uh, the balance you see uh, some of the moody chaps you know who are prone to depression they have low levels of dopamine and if you look at their frontal regions they may have the right connectivity but they don't have the enough dopamine and if you take these risk takers and you you, you take the formula 1 racers or you take these mountaineers who you know who go uh, climb the everest or you know without oxygen you know they are taking extreme risk that happens only when you have enough dopamine in your frontal circuitry it is not enough if you have dopamine in your uh, striatonigral pathway or in your spinal cord but the dopaminergic system must be very strong in your frontal region then you take risk okay i can do this so a risk averse fellow doesn't have that dopamine system so the same thing the capability of empathy and love 
uh, is not there if you don't have oxytocin. Or it, you know, so, so that's a very important point. And there are people who just can't be empathetic. You know, they just uh, look the other way around. I mean, uh, so, so those are the chaps who actually have a lesser amount of oxytocin. And so that's very, very important to have this bonding. It's oxytocin. So people lose a lot of money when, uh, you know, they just take extreme risks. They gamble a lot. They vagar a lot and they lose out on, um, uh, the, 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 you know, their, their, their wealth. And that is also, again, because of excessive dopamine in the system, in the frontal. So it's a balance between the various uh, hormones, uh, not hormones, the neurotransmitters, extremely important. And that's what makes us what we are. It's not just the connections alone, but how the neurotransmitters affect these connections. And so it's a very interesting, intriguing balance. Uh, you may have the right connections, but not the right neurotransmitter. You may have the right neurotransmitter, but the wrong connection. So, you know, you have some vague thinking, you know, there are people who are, you know, you know, lateral thinkers or, you know, they, they always look at some other viewpoint. You know, that's because they have their connections, which are slightly awry. And so they think differently, uh, given a particular uh, circumstance. Yeah, uh, Dinesh, I am now going to uh, hand over to the... things, but I thought I'll hand it over to the uh, president there. Just one remark before I give it to him, Dinesh. We are working, uh, some of the groups in India, we are working on uh, hardcore synthetic biology. Mine is one of the one and only company in, in, in India which is working. So we are working on the gut-brain axis. Uh, and so, um, you know, there are Yep. There are almost like uh, the better half of us is inside the uh, Absolutely. I think that's uh, the gut and the brain and how our microflora in the gut influences how we are and what we are. And that's also, again, you know, we used to always think, you know, okay, uh, Indians are very, you know, concerned about their gut. The gut, uh, this thing, you know, you don't go to the loo in the morning, you know, your day is gone. <laughs> Whereas a Westerner is not like that. A Westerner, sorry about that. A Westerner is not like that. Um, so that's, uh, they're not bothered whether they go to the potty or not. But the point is that the gut has a tremendous influence. It and uh, I, it's a very, very nice point that uh, you, I, th I, I think we should, uh, I, I will interact much more with you now. Thank you. I mean, we will, we will. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful session, doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Pleasure you. is mine. You have taken us through a wonderful journey from surgery, surgery in Shushruta civilization to the anatomy ah. of Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens brain and Neanderthals. I have thoroughly enjoyed each and every slide of yours. Thank you. Our brain truly is wider than the sky. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to extend a warm welcome to our charter president, Dr. Lakshmipati. Oh, welcome, Dr. Lakshmipati. I also welcome the charter members of our club, SVB uncle, Dr. Belly uncle and Raghavan uncle. Our charter members have been the brains behind formation of Rotary Coimbatore Central. It is only right. It is. Our charter members have been the brains behind the formation of Rotary Coimbatore Central. It is only right that so many brains behind Rotary Central have joined the session today on our brain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you once again, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. been a yeah. wonderful experience for me and uh, uh, very fulfilling and, and seeing uh, my... Uh, Professor Lakshmi Pati, I mean, uh, I, it's, it's wonderful, sir. Uh, just seeing you, uh, meeting you on, uh, is, is wonderful. Right. Thank you, thank you. Uh, All of you, Dr. Prakash. Dr. Pra Prakash, yeah. I request a vote of thanks. Yeah. Uh, President, I must...
confess i made a mistake while reading the invitation hmm. i read as a do you, you have brain i was thinking how can a speaker ask a centralized do you have brain <laughs> but when i put the first slide only i realized this do we have brain so i put totally you turn in my presentation and i thank uh, our speaker uh, dr dinesh naik who is our uh, family friend also naik sir i'm uh, from dr ramraj family yes i'm dr prakash you know sir i know i know sir <laughs> anyway Uh, i also thank uh, for your brilliant presentation it's so useful helpful not only for other people we as a doctors i think right from rakhivati we learned a lot today it's a very fulfilling uh, lecture and uh, i also thank for taking time of yours and to come and uh, we i must uh, confess i must tell boldly though we lost our teacher dr pranesh we have nayak here of course Pranesh is different. You are almost like Pranesh. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, thank you very much once again. I also thank all of you for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, Dr. Prakash. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dinesh. You can log thank off. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful. Thank you very much. It's, thank, you. It's, thank you. Thank you. Fifth meeting of Rotary Coimbatore Central adjourned. <laughs>